So the Times Radio, they're obviously the, the broadcast arm of the Times newspaper. Is that why it was set up to push the Times stories a bit more? Or it is, I, I believe when you started, you wanted to come with a slightly sort of different approach to say the BBC, yeah, I say the Today programme of interviewing politicians and doing things. What was the thesis for setting up Times why, Radio? Why are we here? I think it's a business clearly to the point of why. So there are several, the, the business model, I suppose, first off, is we have no advertising, but we do have one is sponsored, so shows are sponsored, John Pinar show is sponsored by Land Rover. The, the second half of the, the revenue, because there is no advertising and we don't have a license fee like the BBC, it is free, free to air. The business model is by talking about Times, by hopefully getting quite a few listeners, then we may drive people to want to read the Times, either buy or subscribe to it. Digital subscriptions are, are king, really, for, for the future of print, and we're having a lot of success with that. Time subscriptions are going up very healthily. We would like to think as a result of Times Radio in existence. Uh, in terms of figures, radio figures monitored by something called Radio, which is the, it's a survey I believe done quarterly. That's been delayed because of COVID. So what we do know is that we've had a lot of downloads of the app at Smartphone. We can monitor the, the people listening online, and that's really healthy. We had something like 200,000 downloads of the app by the end of day two, uh, which was uh, great. Being that well, trying to be a bit more cuddly and soft with letting politicians finish their question. Is that, I mean, does it work? Have you kept to it, do you think, after whatever, three or four months ago? So as you say, so that's the business one. To answer your, your previous yeah. question, you've always got to like the interviews, finish the answers as well, Charles. Yes. Uh, a little tip for you there. Uh, there's the business model, which is yeah, that uh, um, the subscript driving to time subscriptions uh, and sponsorship. But there's also the model for getting listeners to us, why we think people, there are a lot of radio stations out there, why, why not? And we really generally think there is a gap in the market. Yeah. No, yeah. I've worked with Andrew Neal before. I, I was uh, one of the regular pundits on the, the Sunday yeah. politics program. Yeah. You know, when you look at the way he used to interview on This Week, the evening program on Thursdays, and in Sunday politics sometimes, he, he can be a brilliantly charming interviewer yeah. as well. Yeah. The Rottweiler thing is uh, uh, something he performs largely, you know, during election time, there's fades brilliant. But, you know, the, the way he tickles his guests, you know, it's Michael Till or Diane Abbott or whatever it might be on this week to, to reveal stuff. David Frost put it brilliantly. There's a fantastic, by the way, podcast, which is started by his son, Wilfred Frost, called The Frost Heads. Right. And David Frost, has this, uh, who's also pioneered, really, the long form into in, you know, from certain British colonists, an American broadcast yeah. as well. And he always believed that Aesop's fable parallel about the sun and wind, who is going to get the man's coat off first? The wind by blowing the, the guy's coat off, in fact, the guy just yeah. holds his coat closer, or the sun by charming him with comfort and warmth, and that gets the man to take his coat off. So relaxing people, not interrupting them, we never interrupt an interview ever, it's a really important rule. Over time, I think this is happening now, actually, um, certainly we're, we're quite blue science working on GNT, uh, ministers will come on and they will know, because they're, they're talking to us, that we're not going to interrupt them, uh, we're going to let them speak, we're going to let them get their line out. But the quick pro quo is, they don't just stick to the slightly tedious lines to take, they are a bit more expansive, and they can relax a bit more, and that's happening. We have camera ministers on GNT every Sunday morning, and we hope and we think they're opening up a bit more. So. Journalist is still quite reluctant to say to politicians, Minister, you're not answering the question. It's sort of quite often we'll try and answer them. And I always sit there listening and say, call him out, laddering on about what he wants to say or she wants yeah, to I say. We, I mean, we certainly do that on, on Times Radio. Yeah, good, good. Um, and be because we Tell get on Sunday morning to listen to it. Because we give them a, a chance to speak, we have almost have more liberty to say, hang on a minute, we just let you give a one minute answer. Why are you not, uh, why did you not actually give the answer to the question that we are? So I think we do, and I think, I think we're pretty good at it. I know you've interviewed Trump twice. You've interviewed Zoom Cameron in May and the whole lot quite a few times. What's been your highlight interview that you've done over the last 10 years, political interview? It's tough to be the president. Yeah. Um, it really is. I interviewed him twice. Once last, was it last year, the year before, the year before, when he came over the, the former state visit and, and met the Queen in the Oval Office, which was a uh, quite exciting experience. So, uh, to tee up the, to, yeah. to, to the state visit. And then the year before that, 2017, I interviewed him in the Brussels, US Embassy in Brussels, yeah. just before a NATO summit, which was again to tee up his first visit to the UK as president, working as a Royal State visit. Just getting inside the West Wing was a massive you know, ambition fulfilled. 
it's a lot smaller than you might think. Right. Uh, we were sitting uh, outside on a, in a corridor, sort of waiting for a while. I'm sure he was delayed. And we showed him to the Oval Office, and he wasn't there. So it was uh, just us and Sarah Solomon's press. He's got a den the other side of right. uh, uh, the Oval Office, where I spent, that's where the TV is and the old shows and no, where, um, a lot of tweeting. Bill Clinton used to hang out a bit. No idea what you're referring to, Charlie. But um, there is a, there's the Oval Office, which is the formal office, and there's the actual office where he works. Right. Nothing on the Oval Office yeah. uh, desk where he does his sort of you know calls. And there's a little oak box with a red button there, uh, which is the only thing on there. And so we 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 got slightly fixated with this red button, and we're sort of looking at it, wondering, well, we know we do the phones. What happens with that button? Is, is that the you know? Is, we press it, you know, just just do our seats open up, and we fall into the shop. Is that the nuclear strike button on North Korea? And so we're asking these questions, we get about 10 minutes in, and Trump gets sort of more, more sort of uncomfortable with his question. You start with soft questions and then slightly harder ones. And, and then he, he just, out of nowhere, just gets and jabs the red button. And yeah, he yeah. tries to read it. Yeah. And then we thought, what's going to happen next? And then 30 seconds later, the butler arrives from one of the side doors with a tray, uh, a silver tray and a dark coat on it. There we go. And presented it yeah. to the president. And it turns out the red button on the president's desk is the dark coat. Dark. Dark. Is the election Biden's to lose or will Trump pull it out of the bag? I think it's Biden's to lose now. Um, experts who follow things close, 85, 90% seems to be the, 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 the chances of, of, of Biden winning. So it, I think it really is. It, that something quite spectacular would have to happen uh, to now and polling day. But there's still a couple of weeks to go. So. Uh, it, that thing could happen. It does very much now that like um, uh, Trump's going to be a one-term president. Change. Have MPs become more rebellious against their own parties over the last ten years? It seems to be a very yeah. kind of tighter mass coalition. And things. Yeah, it, it's really interesting what's happened with what used to be a very comfortable majority at debating. And I think there are several reasons for it. One, uh, Tory roots will say, is because MPs aren't there; they're not on the estate very much anymore yeah. because social distancing, so it's hard to grip them, it's hard to establish a sort of community spirit, and they're far more pulled by the demands of their constituents who they're in front of on a daily basis. I think also uh, the, the sense of reverence has, has gone a bit, and certainly in the Conservative Party, that not everyone has to do what the government whip uh, is on that particular day, because they haven't really done that over the last two or three years. And also, the third point, the Red Wall is slightly different. Yeah. And they are a different kind of breed. They are, we had one, uh, Peter Gibson, the MP for Dogs in our, our programme last Sunday, who was saying, look, we're not, he said, his words, we're not old Etonians. You know, we're not uh, born with deference and a natural respect for our higher and up. We're elected by our constituents and, and they're the ones we're going to serve, not yeah. some government of the day. So, Giles, what we now? Would you want um, Mr. Gendlin on uh, the dog meat interview? I mean, off for both, I think it's yeah. the answer. Uh, having an MP in there certainly helps, especially, I mean, you know, the Amber Lecter, as you know, as we discovered with um, Giles Watney and others, uh, having a Tory MP campaigning for something that isn't government policy, that it gives you the best possible purchase. Yeah. Because you know that gives us the great uh, word revolt or rebellion. I think the government is quite committed to um, net zero and a, a lot of the green agenda. Actually, I think we'll see more of that over the next year pan out with the recovery. A lot of you heard it from the prime minister. He's, he's going to, to uh, offshore wind in his conference speech. It's not, not particularly well fleshed out. It has to be said. But I mean, there is an ideological sign up to this. You might go and borrow some. Carrie Simmons, who I am regularly relied on from, is by far the most important advisor mm. the Prime Minister has, and yeah. uh, he does listen to all of what she says. I think ideologically, uh, they're signed up to it. Uh, they would very much like to see it happen. They want to enact policies to do that. The problem will be, as Johnny will well know, is when you have an economy that's crashing and some incredibly difficult decisions to, to make on tax, on putting further you know, economic burdens on companies, on you know, carbon tax, whatever it might be, on individuals for what can be used to call the green crap mm -hmm. uh, for consumers. When you have that sort of environment and you're having to make choices of you know, saving jobs, on people's income versus the environment, because it really is, it's a bit of a you know, suicide game there, isn't it? You, know, you either do tax people more and, and force them to do alternative things with their, their businesses or you don't. That is when we'll see it tested. And what outcome do you think Johnson would like? I think I, I think it's reasonably clear the entirety of the British government would prefer a Biden <laughs> victory. It's not a great choice for them, I don't think, because clearly Boris has personal links to Trump. Trump still likes Boris a lot, possibly more than Boris likes Trump. Um, Trump has caused Boris a lot of trouble this year. There's a lot of nervousness about a second term Trump presidency in terms of international relations. Great fear that he might pull out yeah. the NATO altogether. So having Biden in is he's a lot more of a reliable 
really traditional internationalist. That said, Biden's a Democrat, and although there's not much difference between the Democrats and the Tories, really, Biden could be a, a more left-wing Democrat, and there's no personal love loss between you know, Obama Biden uh, as yeah. uh, Biden's, yeah. Obama's vice yeah. president uh, and Boris Johnson and that's on the colourful language. The, the choices are great. I think overall they definitely prefer Biden, but there's, there's a lot of work that's going to have to be done yeah. to ingratiate themselves in with the Biden White House, which is, I think, naturally going to be um, not hostile, but certainly not very warm and friendly to, to this long term. COVID might end up being Scottish independence. The, there was a poll this week that was um, very scary for the Unionists. Yes. You know, Scottish Independence now you know, closing on 60% support uh, in Scotland. Brexit and coronavirus have not helped the argument for the Union. I mean, I think that's quite straightforward now, yeah. and whatever side of the fence on either you sit on. There will be a titanic battle coming, obviously, over this with the Scottish elections in, in May. If Sturgeon wins big, you know, she'll claim a mandate. But looking under the bonnet on that, Interestingly, what people in number 10 say is that actually the bar for Sturgeon to claim this tremendous mandate and this tremendous you know, ability to now go on and hold a second referendum is quite high because she's done so well already. You know, she, the SP dominates Scottish politics. They've got whatever it is, you know, 40, 45 of the 57 or so Scottish MPs. They've already got you know, control of, of Holyrood. How much more control would you have to, to need? How many more seats in Holyrood would you have to need? Because he just wins back control of Holyrood without you know, taking another 10 SNP or something like that, then it's very hard to say, well, where is your mandate? So it's going to be a very interesting argument that, that she forges. And also, you know, the law of the land is, there ain't going to be a, a binding legal referendum unless the UK government says so. And the UK government are on reasonably strong ground by pointing back to the 2014 referendum to say, well, you know, we all agree there's once a generation, You've had that as a chance and you've lost it. So undoubtedly, independent the support for independence has increased during uh, for the duration of Brexit and COVID. That's not necessarily to say that independence is, is more likely. I think I think yeah. that's quite a large leap. Tom, thank you very much My for pleasure. being with us. Thank you everyone else as well for joining us today. Um, and thank you for those who asked questions. We very much hope that you enjoyed that, and we very much hope we'll see you at the next one.